on YouTube. I am transitioning the screen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hour 28 of CosmoQuest's Hangout-a-thon. For 32 hours, not contiguous, we are pausing to sleep. We are bringing you science, scientists, games, art, and discussions of both the hard things and the fun things related to space science. This hour, we're looking at something that is uh, punny and awesome. So, so I'm going to get the pun out of the way and be done with it. Pun's probably not the, quite the right word. So I grew up in Massachusetts. I'm from Westford, Massachusetts, two towns over from Lowell, Massachusetts, named after the Lowell family and the Lowell Mills. So growing up, when I heard that this man named Percival Lowell had funded an an observatory in Arizona from the money his family earned with these mills that I had visited on school trips. I thought that was the coolest thing ever because I was a small child. Um, Percy Lowell had also, in looking through his telescopes, seen the, the poles that were icy and how they seasonally changed. And he imagined that these things were at the edge of his vision to read and to see. He, he thought he saw canals. He thought he saw vegetation. And as someone who is now starting to have to use reading glasses, I understand how this happens. He probably just needed glasses. But those early days, and, and for so very long, people thought Mars this world that also exists in the sun's habitable zone, maybe, just maybe, its color fluctuations represented water. And then the Mariner missions happened, and the Viking missions happened. And the very first time I ever went to an astronomical meeting that was planetary science focused in 2002, I learned a word I had never heard before, and it was aeolian. Because at this conference, everyone was saying, all these valleys, all these structures, all of these things were generated by the wind. And I was sad. But now we have new missions like Perseverance, the other Percy, exploring waterways. And we have a team of researchers, the swim team led by Gareth Morgan and Than Putzig, who is one of the researchers who is here with me today, that are using data from myriad observatories, some of them no longer functioning, to try across multiple wavelengths using complex software that I know Megan Russell has been part of, also joining us to figure out Where's the water hiding beneath the surface? And, and Than, Megan, thank you so much for joining me this hour. Can, can you both tell me how wet Mars was when you first started studying it, according to science? Than, I'm gonna go to you because I think we're about the same age. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Pamela. Um, great introduction. Um, so I first started studying Mars um, in 2001, um, having uh, worked in a different field prior to that. Um, and um, at that time, there were a lot of open questions. Um, we were still really just getting the first results back from the Mars Global Surveyor, which is no longer operating at Mars. Uh, it's an orbiter that was, had it, you know, a real game-changing set of cameras and uh, could measure out the elevation of Mars uh, quite precisely with its laser altimeter. Um, and then uh, thermal spectrometers were telling us an awful lot about the surface, both in terms of the minerals that are exposed there, some of which seem to be related to exposure to water, um, as well as uh, the, the thermal properties can tell us about the materials in the sub, uh, down into the subsurface, at least in the upper meter or so. Um, and um, shortly uh, in that same year, another spacecraft launched to Mars, the um, Mars Odyssey, 
Um, and that one was carrying, uh, or is carrying, I should say, since it's still operating. <laughs> it's still alive. Um, and uh, it was carrying a neutron spectrometer um, and a gamma ray spectrometer suite uh, that uh, essentially was able to peer into that upper meter of the subsurface and find a, a vast quantity of hydrogen in the higher latitude. Now, I want to pause right here because this is magic. They have on the spacecraft, 2001 Mars Odyssey, a clear mm -hmm. reference to Asimov, or Clark rather, sorry, a clear reference to Clark. Um, they have the capacity to measure neutrons. When we think water, we don't think neutrons, but hydrogen contains neutrons, water contains hydrogen. When our sun is active, it flings high energy particles at Mars, Mars atmosphere goes, I don't really exist. Mars magnetic field says, I really don't exist. These particles that we're protected from here on Earth make it to the surface of Mars, make it through the first bit of the soil, hit hydrogen, and neutrons go flying. And it's these neutrons generated from solar particles that make it to orbit from beneath the ground, magic. Yeah, no, it, it's, it, if you've ever played a game of like um, billiards or pool, yeah, um, you know that when a, a ball of the same size hits another ball, they sort of bounce off of each other. Um, and some of the energy is imparted to the, the target ball and some to the ball it was coming in. Um, and so the speed at which it reflects off of that ball is different. Um, then say if it deflects off a very hard object, like if you've ever dropped one of those balls on the floor, you know, it comes back really fast because it's hitting a very heavy uh, object. Um, and by measuring the speed of these neutrons coming off, that's how they know that there's all these hydrogen atoms um, in the subsurface. And because the concentration is so high at these higher latitudes, the only reasonable explanation for that much hydrogen is water, um, and specifically water ice. So, so. So, we... I mean, up until this point, we didn't really have this sort of direct detection of the hydro or of the water. And, you know, it, it's a little, you know, you're actually detecting the hydrogen, not the water, but still it's a, it's a much closer true detection um, than we'd had prior to that. So that was a real game-changing uh, instrument in our array of instruments that we use to study Mars. So did you start your research from the Mars is a desert, get over this whole concept of life? Or did you start <laughs> from the Mars looks like it could have water or from the Mars definitely has water? You know, the even at that time, there was a, a lot of debate um, in the scientific community over whether Mars had much water remaining. It was, I think most people agreed that there was evidence that there had been water ice mm -hmm. billions of years ago, or not water ice necessarily, but liquid water even, yeah. uh, carving out channels and such. Uh, but those are all very old features, at least the large scale ones. Um, and so this debate kind of went back and forth. Some people were in the camp where it's always been kind of frozen and cold and not had that much water. Um, and other people were like, no, there's been huge oceans of water on the surface. And tsunamis. Um, and tsunamis. Yes. 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 <laughs> Don't forget about the tsunamis. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. <laughs> so I, I think yeah. that maybe at that time, you know, 20 odd years ago, um, I think the desert people were kind of in, in the lead, <laughs> um, just in, the, in that debate. Um, but I think things maybe have moved in the other direction in the ensuing time. And, you know, we've got better data now. We've got a, a better understanding of, of where this water ice is and, um, and, and, and also a better understanding of how that may have evolved over time. So, so Megan, you came to this story later because you were younger. Where, what was the condition of Mars when you first started studying it? Um, well, it was really, it was really interesting because obviously there are people that sort of make their, I mean, you kind of make your scientific career based on a, 
certain being in a certain camp in various aspects. And so there's the warm and wet Mars community and then the cold and dry Mars community. And I think around the time that I became more like from a scientific um, perspective, I became more familiar with Mars. Definitely we were seeing a lot more cold and dry yeah. um, researchers out there. Um, when I was in grad school in Vancouver, um, one of my lab mates, um, Anna Grau, um, was, uh, she was studying, um, features left over from potential like past glaciers on Mars. Um, and so her findings were kind of pushing things in the direction of there, maybe there was water on Mars, but for a lot of time it was actually trapped up in ice. Um, and so that's kind of where I came into the, the story. I actually got my my start in uh, in Venus, so it was nice to be able to make that that jump over to Mars. <laughs> Just a skip and a hop. You jump from one extreme of habitability, <laughs> a habitable zone, rather to the other extreme of the habitable zone. I kind of love it. Yep, it definitely did. I love it. Like so, I was I still got my start studying volcanism on Venus, and now I'm studying ice on Mars. <laughs> now, in two thousand and I'm trying to get the year exactly right, 2007. I remember having to run up to Emily Lakdawalla at a Lunar and Planetary Sciences Conference, again, astrophysicist, and say, olivine, why does everybody care? Hematite, that one I didn't ask her about. I Googled that one. Um, mm -hmm. all these minerals started to be detected. And now you're working from space, looking at minerals and chemical compositions of the ground. Can you give us a bit of the story of what the different modern rocks we see from space are telling us about the history? We're gonna start with the, the chemistry, and then move on to the high-resolution images, which in the last three years have changed everything. So someone want to take on olivine, hematite, and all of these minerals as a starting point? No, no one does. No <laughs> one. All right. So My background is more geophysics. but That's um, fine. I, yeah, I think the... the um, I think the clays are what I would be more, uh, uh, I guess, um, familiar with. All right. So, so this was exciting to me because I like beading and olivine and hematite are things I was familiar with and have yeah. held in my hand. And then you can hold in your hands and you can make jewelry out of it. And it's, yeah, beautiful. And they're beautiful. And it turns out both of these minerals can only form in a wet environment. And the fact that we have these minerals on Mars was indicative that there had to have been a wet environment in the past. And this really starts to get at the root of the work that you're doing today. I had to build the story, sorry. Um, where you're trying to figure out where all that water went. And I want Dan, if you could, for you to tell us the story of the SWIM project, which has perhaps one of the best, is it a backronym? Did, is it actually a backronym? How did no, the name come not. from and it what do not. you do? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can explain the acronym. All right. Um, so um, back in uh, 2015, NASA held a workshop. Um, I th uh, it was in Houston. Um, I didn't actually go to the workshop, but I knew a number of people that did. Um, and it was to, you know, kind of brainstorm about human landing sites. Um, and uh, so there was a whole range of people from different aspects of, you know, exploration from the human side of exploration, the engineering and, and the science side as well. Um, and the idea was to, you know, what, let's uh, figure out if we're good, you know, when we first send the humans to Mars, where exactly should we send them in terms of, you know, the safest place to land, um, the most interesting uh, features on the surface to look at, um, and, you know, the most kind of sustainable place to land. Um, and that last one, um, 
people uh, quickly came to realize that a really important factor here was having resources on the ground. Um, and the most, um, really the most critical resource in a human mission to Mars is rocket fuel, right? Um, if you have to bring all the rocket fuel with you that you need to get back off the surface, that's a tremendous amount. There's like a factor of 100 or so in the, the calculation of the mass that you need to launch from Earth in order to get all that fuel um, all the way to Mars so then you can get back off the surface. Um, and so it was soon realized that ideally we would be able to generate our own fuel at the surface. Um, and, you know, a, um, a, a way to live off the land in the Mars environment is to use water, um, be it in a frozen or a liquid form, um, and react it with a carbon dioxide that makes up 95% of the atmosphere to create methane um, and, um, and oxygen, by the way, that you might want for breathing. Um, Maybe. Maybe. Okay, so uh, <laughs> so the, uh, coming out of this workshop, uh, it was, you know, there were a lot of discussions about, well, what do we know about where is water on Mars? And generally, it was all up towards the pole. Yeah. You know, that those detections of that hydrogen in the upper meter were mostly poleward of like 50, 55 degrees in each hemisphere. So it's it's way up near the pole. And those are not places that you want to send humans, especially yeah. if you're going to have a longer term um, presence there, because the atmosphere literally freezes out on top of you at those latitudes in the winter. Um, you know, carbon dioxide ice builds up on the surface and crushes things like the Phoenix lander. Um, uh. So, uh, <laughs> so the out, coming out of the workshop is like we really need to figure out where the heck all the water ice is, um, and, and not just in that upper meter. We need to know where it is at greater depths as well. Um, and around that same time, you know, a, a lot of publications started coming out about finding water ice with a sounding radar um, in areas of the mostly in the northern mid latitudes that were closer to the equator than predicted by the uh, neutron spectrometer and other methods um, that only look at that shallow um, subsurface. Um, the radar sounder can see down tens or even hundreds of meters depending on the material properties in the subsurface. Um, in addition, um, you know, the uh, volume of really high resolution images coming from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's the high resolution camera was finding all of these geomorphic features down at these latitudes that also look like they probably contain water ice. Um, so there was this thought, well, let's go and figure out, you know, what all this data is telling us, how close closer to the equator, can we find water ice? And this was the whole impetus behind SWIM. And it, so it wasn't really driven by the science. Um, so one unique aspect is that this was really a resource-driven activity. Go find all this water ice. We do care how it got there, but mostly we care about where it is and you know how, how concentrated is it. Because you know, once you find the ice, then you have to figure out how are you going to extract it. How are you going to, you know, pull the turn it into a liquid so you then react it and all of those kind of things. Now, um, so that was sort of how Swim got started. Now, um, my um, colleague Gareth Morgan and I uh, actually had two little independent studies. Uh, they were just kind of pilot studies to sort of do the first poking at this problem. Uh huh. Um, and we decided that, our, you know, the work that we were doing was so complementary that we were going to pitch merging our teams together and do a much broader study. Yeah. Well, NASA liked this idea and they told us to go back and, you know, put together a proposal. Um, and of course, with a proposal to NASA, you have to come up with a name, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the snappier the name, the better. And so Gareth and I are sitting around brainstorming, well, what are, you know, what do we call this thing? And, and we're like, well, what are we doing? We're, we're mapping subsurface water ice on Mars. Um, and it, it just sort of 
fell out of that. So thing. subsurface, like, subsurface water, water ice, ice mapping. mapping. And we wrote it down and we looked at the letters and we're like, swim. <laughs> <laughs> Like a Ouija board. <laughs> just, it's just, it's just, just came to us. <laughs> that, I, wow, okay. I'm, I'm, so we actually, with our Escape Velocity Space News, we, we haven't done it as much as we should, but for a while, we, we were actually making, making a segment on the best, worst backronyms and acronyms that we found in journal like articles. Messenger. <laughs> Oh, messenger nice. definitely yeah. someone put some effort into creating that there's the old sauron detector uh yeah the science is full of these oh, yeah. and and i <laughs> i love that you accidentally stumbled on something that both matched what you were doing and was aesthetically pleasing to the kind of science coming out of it, or at least resources right. <laughs> coming out of it. Yeah. At first, we were given a little pause. I mean, you can't exactly swim in the ice. No, <laughs> you shouldn't try at least. I mean, like, we, we've been talking about the fifth season books by, by uh, M.K. Jemison, where there are people who swim in rocks, but they're not oh. human. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Now, you are working on research development. This is the kind of work that will hopefully one day lead to something that's near and dear to my heart, which is human beings getting to the red planet and potentially being able to do some of the things that, that just can't be done quickly and effectively yet by robots like fossil hunting. That is near and dear sure. to my heart. Um, to get there, we need to combine not just where are the resources, but where is the land safe and how has everything been processed over time? And by processed, I mean processed by the environment. Mm -hmm. The past history of Mars water turns out to be much more violent than I ever imagined. And, and Megan, you, you started to hint at this earlier. It was discovered back in, I think the paper came out in 2018 or 19, that there were tsunamis on Mars. Can, can you give us a rundown on that? Yeah, so um, it's funny because I was at an LPSC talk recently and someone mentioned Martian tsunami and everybody started laughing and then <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. real yeah yeah exactly um yeah i mean the there might have been periods in time where there was like enough water for tsunami to happen um enough freestanding water not trapped in um ice or um trapped up in minerals as we're seeing now um but it's really cool how a lot of the science is put together because we're looking at extremely sort of indirect evidence in the, the geology and the morphology of the features that we see on the surface. Um, so I think that there's, it, I think it's a very like complex topic that a lot of people at PSI are working on and coming at it from various aspects. And, and so this was work that the first author, I believe, was Alexis Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Cargill was also part of it. I don't remember who all else was on the paper. Uh, as always, there is there is an entire cast required to get at the big ideas in science. And in looking at the landscapes, they were able to see defined features in how rock formations were cut into, how landscapes were cut into, that we know are consistent with tsunamis previously happening here on our world. And the distribution of rocks and so many other things can really help us understand there was a landslide here, there was a tsunami there, and trace water through both its lingering phenomena through the cuts of stream beds and river beds and through the drastic phenomena through the cutting of valleys and splashing of boulders. Um, the idea of splashing boulders is just lovely. So, yeah, definitely. So as, as you're exploring, what are the kinds of characteristics that go into defining water ice beneath the surface that is useful? 
Ooh, that is useful. That's a yeah. really good question. Um, because as part of the SWIM project, I spent a lot of time looking at the highest resolution visible images that we have of the Martian surface with the high rise um, camera. And Mars at that scale, um, I think I was looking at between 25 and 50 centimeter resolution. Um, so the, Per pixel. Yeah. Per pixel, yeah. Yeah, so the, the camera's picking up features and being able to distinguish features that are maybe twice as big as that. Uh, Mars at that scale is really trippy. There are a lot of features that I was seeing in the images that were, some of them looked similar to features that we would see on the Earth in the permafrost environments, um, like tundra polygons. Um, so up in northern Canada, there these are studied. Um, it's There's a sort of a cyclic freezing and thawing of um, the surface of the like basically the ground um, that creates these um, ice wedges in the ground and they happen to create this uh, really beautiful pattern of uh, polygonal terrain so polygons just stamped right into the surface um, and I was looking at a lot of those in these images on the surface of Mars um, and so those would indicate if you sort of compare those similar features that I was looking at on Mars and compare them to how we know they form on the Earth, that would indicate that there is um, ice in the shallow subsurface that is taking part in this freeze thaw cycle. Um, so that would indicate that the water, the ice is trapped up. It's somewhat shallow, so easier to get to than, say, some mass of ice underneath the surface or the ice at the poles. Um, and but it's it's a it's kind of interesting because you don't know if these features were created are being sort of they're active today if these are features that are from something that's happening right now so the ice is there right now and it's you know this shallow subsurface is freezing and thawing or if these are features from a uh, recent or distant past where there were there was ice and these features were being created and they're no longer active and they just sort of indicate that something happened before and it's not necessarily happening now and can't necessarily indicate that there is ice there right now. And I was seeing a lot of other really, really trippy features, um, basically like giant fields of these polygons um, that were, they would actually create like really interesting giant patterns um, that seem to just, um, form based on like the topography of the landscape or maybe local clim climatic conditions or in the bottom of a crater. Um, so that would be, I mean, the, these, so these polygons would indicate that there is shallow enough ice that maybe humans could go there with a drill one day and yeah. dig it up, hopefully. Um, but uh, looking at if they're active now and indicating something that's there now versus something that was happening in the past and is no longer there is kind of an interesting question. So I'm, I'm going to show my ignorance here with with the polygonal structures. Do we have data of the same regions across a large enough separation of years that we can expect to see changes in the surface? So these these images that I was looking at at this mm -hmm. really high resolution, they tend to be they're basically they're it's, when you look at them, they're postage stamp size. So there's like little sort of very localized areas that are being captured in these images. Um, and they're kind of scattered all over the surface of Mars. And anybody can set up an area that they want to monitor with this camera, with this high-rise camera. It's called High Wish. So yes. you can actually submit an area for monitoring or taking pictures of it. Um, I'm not familiar if anybody has done, has taken a time series of images with this high resolution camera um, to, to study the the change over time. I know that there are a lot of landscape um, deformation studies, but based on other types of data, like the slightly coarser resolution CTX or um, the yeah CTX or um, the European instruments. Um, so that would be really cool. So I, I, have, I have oh, something that I can discuss with you when we are not on air and plot for the future. Excellent. <laughs> so I, I would add to um, Megan's discussion about the polygons. Um, so these polygons actually occur, diff different types of polygons occur at different scales. Um, and the ones that uh, swim teams have been focusing on most recently are the ones that 
Megan was describing. Um, these are the smaller scale that are really only mappable with the high rise images um, because they're they're small enough that the coarser resolution cameras like CTX, um, the context camera, um, it can't really make out these polygons. Um, and one reason we chose to map these polygons is we got a clue that they may be more indicative of present day ice, partly from their scale because smaller features get erased quicker, um, but also because um, in other studies with a high rise camera, um, we've identified fresh impacts occurring yeah. during the course of the mission. So you image an area, there's no sign of a crater. You come back next year, you image it again, and boom, there's a crater. Um, and in some of these craters, white material is actually exposed at the surface. Um, and with a spectrometer on the same spacecraft, we uh, looked at this material and ascertained that it is in fact water ice. Um, and in fact, if you come back and re-image that same crater with the white material around it, the white material fades over time um, because it's sublimating away and getting covered with dust. Um, and so these are ice exposing impacts occurring in the current day. Um, and invariably, with these ice exposing impacts, we see this scale of polygon. Oh, um, so that was a pretty good clue that these polygons are kind of a proxy for present day ice. It gave us a little more confidence that these specific features are more likely to be associated with current ice. And yeah, and that's, go ahead, Megan. Oh, I was just gonna say that um, that specific impact that Sam is talking about was kind of as close as we can get to an in situ observation of that because these this image, I mean, combined with other lines of evidence, of course, but the images taken of that ice exposing impact, you can see what looks like giant ice cubes on the surface. Like mm -hmm. it's very clear. They're very cool. And and this is the kind of stuff that makes it clear just how important it is to do what, I mean, in astronomy, we say there's multi-messenger astronomy when we are looking at things for gravitational waves, neutrinos, mm. and light. And mm. I feel like with planetary science, we are doing multi-messenger science as well, just with very different messengers where there, there have been times when InSight seismograph spotted quakes that then were uh, found by the orbiting vehicles and we can dream of a day of having rovers capable of moving fast enough to go sample these things. Rovers move slower than anyone can imagine. <laughs> and, and I have to ask, when InSight was active, there were two quakes it measured and one that it measured um, where two of them were new impacts in the third, a 4.7 uh, magnitude quake, they never found a crater associated with it. And so they believe that was, was geographic. Were, was your team part of any of the great where's the impact searches of data? <laughs> no, we weren't um, wrapped up in that, that search for the impact. Um, but once that impact, one of those impacts exposed water ice. At yes. The surface. Um, and it, this and this was important to our study because mm -hmm. it was kind of on the edge of where we were mapping um, the the exposure or the existence of the water ice in the near subsurface. And it dug down very deep, maybe 10 meters or so. Yeah. It was a large impact um, and exposed water ice. So um you know, it was it was an important data point for our study to understand yes in fact you know where we the ed, the edge of our ability to find the water ice an impact is actually excavated water ice there um so that that was a, a nice um confirmation of the work that we've been doing um w one thing that you had said earlier though was um you know, you're you're discussing this uh, confluence of different pieces of information. Yes. Right. Well, so that's what the swim team was really all about. Um, you know, all of the these different methods, the neutron spectrometer and the thermal spectrometers that sense the shallowest materials, the radar, which tells us about 
well, the radar surface return tells us about things in the near surface, like yes. for five years. And then we can get discrete reflections from much deeper, tens or even hundreds of meters. Um, and then uh, the geomorphology gives you not a real quantitative measure, but sort of a qualitative handle on how thick the ice might be. Um, so we have all these disparate measures, all measuring into different depths. They're all kind of have different spatial resolutions. And we're trying to pull all these data sets together to say something um, definitive uh, about the presence of the ice. Um, and that so we struggled with this problem a mm -hmm. lot. Um, we actually, yeah, as we were brainstorming about it one day early in the project, um, we thought about um, the Drake equation about, yes. you know, is there life elsewhere in the universe? Well, that has the same sort of thing where there's all these different factors. Some of them you might want to weight differently than others. Um, and ultimately, you build this big equation to answer the question, is there life elsewhere in the universe? Big problem. A lot of these parameters are not very well constrained. Um, and so SWIM, we have the same thing. And we actually came up with what we call the SWIM equation to understand how the collection of data, data sets is or is not consistent with the presence of ice in the any given location. Tell us more. Keep going. And, uh, well, so um, it, initially we just weighted everything the same because yeah. we didn't really have a good handle on it. Um, but then uh, um, we went and we went back to NASA with this and they were like, they were happy with that, but they really wanted to see if we could maybe tease out a little more information about how the ice varies mm -hmm. with depth. Um, and so because each of these data sets has a different, you know, sensing depth, um, we recast the swim equation to a set of equations um, for different depth zones. Um, so we have one equation with these different factors weighted differently um, for the zero to one meter zone, and then from the one to five meter zone, and then below five meters. So we have three sets of equations for all these different depth zones. And that gives you some sense of how the um, distribution of the ice is varying both geographically and with depth. Um, and so NASA was much happier with this result. Um, of course, one thing it does highlight is that we've got kind of a disconnect in our geophysical data sets where there's the, a, the, a set of them that sense this upper meter only, and then the and then the radar, which is much more coarser and, and tells you about deeper information. So there's kind of a gap really between about one meters depth and 15, 20 meters depth that's not really well characterized uh, by the geophysics. Um, and unfortunately, that's kind of the depth we care the most about <laughs> in terms of finding buried ice as a resource. So are you finding that there are enough regions that seem to indicate there will be a useful amount of water for generating oxygen and rocket fuel that are also in latitudes where modern solar panel technology doesn't make us sad that we're going to have choices to make or is it like two places that we're going to have to pick from no there's a whole array of locations that we've identified um they you know they get down into the 25 to 35 degrees latitude bands in, in both hemispheres um and there are significantly large deposits of ice um, some of them we don't know quite as well how what the concentration of the ice is, which is going to make it difficult to figure out exactly how to go about extracting it. But other places, um, we've got a high level of confidence that it's very nearly pure water ice, extending over tens or up to hundreds of meters. And and these these are mostly what we call uh, debris covered glaciers. Yeah. Um, and they are very large features. I mean, you can sustain a colony of, uh, you know, a, a million people 
um, indefinitely by parking near one of these features and extracting ice from it. Um, they're, you they're you can at least nice. allow them to breathe and drink. The food is still an issue to be solved. The water will help you grow the food. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And and I have to admit, so so as you may have may or may not have heard, we have created a Martian landscape in Mar in Minecraft. It mm -hmm. has sedimentary layers, regions of boulders, amazing valleys clearly cut by water. And within this red landscape, we mm -hmm. have folks building a research station right next to the rocket they landed with. And I've been telling everyone there are buried glaciers on Mars and they <laughs> dug deep enough that they actually found water at the bottom of their well. So your science is, awesome. influ is influencing the games we play to teach science. And I love watching it come full circle. So this has somehow been an amazingly rapidly flying 45 minutes. And, <laughs> and before we go, um, how can people best stay up to date with everything your research team is producing and learn more about these potential landing sites and resource rich locations that you are identifying? Um, so, um, last week there was actually a press release put out about the uh, latest version of the swim map that rolls in a lot of that um, mapping work that um, Megan was describing with mm -hmm. the high resolution uh, images. Um, so look for that press release. You can find it at psi.edu. Um, and um, there's also a uh, a website where we put our products out. Now, the, the new maps have not been completely signed off yet uh, by NASA, so we don't have those um, uh, available just now, uh, but um, they, they soon will be, and we've got new publications um, coming out in the next several months. Um, so we have a website at swim.psi.edu um, where we share out all of our products, and it's not just like you know, images of the maps, it's actually the data behind the maps. So anyone can like pull down the um, maps and maybe cast their own swim equation if they like, um, if they want to, you know, look for things in a different way than we did. And, and we are going to be touching upon that paper in this week's Escape Velocity Space News, which we are going to record right here live during the Hangout-a-thon during the 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific hour. So I, it, it's just one small piece of the entire episode, but it made it in there. There was so much Mars news to try and hit. And then just as we're coming ready, Lucy had to go and discover a binary asteroid and everything uh, got shortened. Yeah, right. um, so yeah, that's eating, eating up binary. all of the space uh, bandwidth. Yeah, yeah. You guys picked entirely the wrong news cycle, but we're going to give you the love your, your research uh, <laughs> deserves like just not all this episode. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. So right now I'm going to switch things over to Veronica Cure on our Minecraft server. And um, we're just going to keep on keeping on. And Than, Megan, thank you so much. And I am going to be reaching out to talk more about those polygons. So thank you, yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate and the opportunity. Sounds awesome. And Veronica, you are live. Wait, why did my screen just change? Veronica, you are live in three, two, one. Hello, everyone. We're going to start doing a tour of our Mars craft in just a moment. Thank you both. I'm just going to so hold on for just one second and get some confirmation. Absolutely that amazing. We're ready. Um, Thank you for the science. Okay, I yeah, we're on ahead, screen. So this. Hold on. What was that? Is not the right mic. Um, okay, we're gonna wait for no, just not another moment. White. Sort of. We're go go take a go take wait. My audio is going out instead of Veronica's audio. Okay, going Okay, we have some different things. Hold going on. on. What? 
Veronica says, why is my audio still going out? All right, I'm going to shut up, and I'm going to hope that only Veronica's going out, and I will Hi. catch up with you, Than. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> Go ahead, Veronica. Okay, so hopefully you all are hearing just me now. Um, but we'll go ahead and uh, get started. This is our main building here on our Marscape. And it's, it's such a beautiful building. I love the um, simplicity of it and how it all um, goes together and just, it just works. Um, so yes, this is our lander that we uh, got to Mars on and our first building here. And then of course we have a big crane to help us make some more buildings. And there have been some more buildings completed lately. Um, so I'm gonna skip over the ones that we've seen a few times before. We still have the um, panel farm. Yeah, I don't know why it hasn't been completed yet, but we still have some room to work on it. Um, we do have a rover, and then now this is new since I've been back. I was out for a little bit. Let's see, Ingenuity Two. Oh, cool. Very nice. And then we have, of course, our garden. So we got our glowberries and our potatoes and carrots and beets and everything we need for hot chocolate except the cow. Um, I'm sure we should have coconut milk somewhere around here. Anyways. Um, and then, of course, you got to have a good book to curl up with. So here's the library. Because, yeah, we just need a few more tables in there so we can have our study session. And then, oh, here's the other garden. Now, this one is just for us. So you can have a seat. And just kind of relax and meditate and forget that you're thousands of miles from everything you used to know. Okay, but we're going to start new. So this is all good. Ah, door. There we go. Oh, good. We got a satellite going here. Nice. This is a good one. This should get us all the messages we want from our family and the newest episodes of uh, Lost in Space or whatever we're watching this time. Watch there be a rerun of Lost in Space. And space suits. I really like these. They're kind of copper color. They definitely fit in with the Mars background. And then of course we have our research center. And you got some crystals going and some books. You got to write everything down. Of course, we have our chemistry area. And then the geologists love this rock area. There's apparently a big difference between coal and charcoal, but uh, I'll let one of them tell you about that. And then this is like another impact crater. Now, this is the newest building that I'm aware of. Um, so, this started off being a aquarium, um, and then it just turned into a science center. And I think the military is sending out a few um, radio signals from it as well. Who knows with them? Uh, so, let's go take a look. Ooh, lots of green. Still a lot of empty spaces. Not quite sure why they had to build such a big building, but there you go. Oh, there is a fish dispenser here. So if you get hungry, you can always have a kipper snack. Um, and there's one staircase. Oh, okay. And, huh. I wonder why these lights are laid out in this formation. 
It's rather interesting. I don't see any signs. Oh, well. And, oh, here's the aquarium. It's just got some kelp in it right now. I guess they put all the fish in the dispensers. That's weird. Um, but hopefully someday we can go out and go for a little swim. And there is an emergency evacuation slide. And go out through the airlock here. Um, oh, research center and future fish farm. I'm not going to try and say that three times fast. I don't think we have a bleeper set up to take care of any uh, mispronunciations. Now, this is new. Oh. I wonder if they grew the bamboo here on Mars. Water treatment and processing. Well, I believe this is an admin. I wonder if they're responsible. Water treatment and processing produces drinking H2O, LH, and LOX. LOX is liquid oxygen. I'm not sure what LH is. Uh, let's see. Stop authorized personnel only. Well, I, I don't really see anyone looking. So, um, yeah, let's, let's just go in. Oh, there's some empty spaces for spacesuits. Water treatment and processing. Oh, this is like a nice, clean area. Sure, I'm glad I took my suit off. Oh, sorry about that. Wild cat attack. And... Huh. I just don't know. Let's see, is this where I came in? I think so. Oh, yep. I'm just going to use this low oxygen level, low gravity. Huh. I wonder what's in these other sections. This is very intriguing. Uh, let me see. Crosstalk, okay, cloudy for me, frame, helicopters for all. Oh, yeah, you, you can eat bamboo. They, they buy, buy it canned in the Asian section of most markets. Nice and tasty. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to keep going until someone lets me know that we're ready to do something else. And we went through those buildings. Now, there were some new buildings over here. And let's go take a look at these. So this is a laboratory. Please add equipment. Well, let's see if we got some equipment in here yet. We do. We have the beginnings of quite a bit here. Got some chemistry sets, like that. And what else is this? Oh, this is, looks like the biology table. Excellent. Got plenty of room to get some more stuff going here, maybe a hood. And I think, oh, and this we looked at. This is the well, and I saw that last hour keeper went on a <clears throat> deep dive of the well, so I'm going to leave that for the next time, and I think we're about ready to go on to the next segment, and uh, you guys will get to hear from Aviva. Yeah, I can hear Allie, but 
I don't think anyone else can just yet. Let's see. And this was, oh, I skipped this. This is the Fancy Pants Hotel because we need the money. The, this is true. This is very true. All right, catch you guys later. your live hello everybody um i am back after a few hours of of uh rest um i don't think my voice is going to be any better so you're you're you get what you get uh joining me this hour is aviva yamani who is our producer of 365 days of astronomy which boy is that the most inaptly named podcast ever at this point since I'm pretty sure that multiple is huge. <laughs> it's like 365,000 days of astronomy at this point. 36,500. Anyway, Aviva, where are you coming to us from? Because that is the first thing people need to know about you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. That's the first thing I want to say. And uh, yeah, I actually, uh, I'm from Indonesia. I'm an astronomy communicator here, and I met Pamela during the communicating astronomy with the public in 2010. And after that, in uh, communicating astronomy with the public in 2011, I guess. Then at that time, we talked. It's like a morning talk or uh, lunchtime. I, I, I definitely it's in it's the talk is in restaurant, and then after that. Uh, I'm going to offer me to take over 365 Days of Astronomy as the project managers to manage 365 Days of Astronomy, okay? Uh, sorry for my English if it's not that good. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> at that time, I really excited to have another project because uh, here in Indonesia, I work, uh, we create an astronomy online media, but it take, uh, it's, like a, it's like a news outlet. So I really excited at that time because uh, the offer for 365 Days of Astronomy, it's about podcasting, something that I really love because in the past, during my childhood, I love to, to, to listen to the radio. Okay, I am come from another generation, I know. <laughs> so I listen to the radio and it affects me much, much because... Uh, it really built my imaginations. It really built my curiosity. So the offer is uh, is something that I think like, okay, I'm going to take it. So I started in, uh, uh, I started with 365 days of astronomy, um, managed 365 days of astronomy. Basically, I met so many people in 365 days of astronomy. By many people, I mean our podcast as well. Uh, I, our podcaster. So we have, podcaster from all over the world, mm -hmm. from north to the south. So <clears throat> it's really exciting to have uh, not only uh, uh, not only diverse podcasters uh, for the country or the culture, but also a uh, diverse uh, topic as well. We have so many topics from um, basic astronomy to uh, observations and then astronomy, uh, cultural astronomy. We have tips and tricks. We have, well, basically we have many things. So it's really, I mean, it it's not only for us uh, um, that uh, it's exciting, but also for our listeners because I I I know that we receive many feedbacks from our listeners as well that. Um, podcast uh 365 days of astronomy podcast help them to uh, understand astronomy and also it's become part of their um, daily um, activities i mean they can do something and then while they uh, keep listening to 365 days of astronomy podcast and then we also have uh, stories from uh, our um, listeners that they download our podcast and then they <clears throat> put it into the cd and they go to the uh, remote area, rural area that without internet, and they uh, provide uh, this audio to the students there. So basically, it's an amazing project, and it's been a long time, more than a decade, because it started in 2009 during International Year of Astronomy. Mm -hmm. 
And so you've been doing this for uh, uh, your own decade, essentially. Um, how many different podcasts do you think you have? And what is the average length of the shows that you run? Wait, <laughs> if you ask me number, then that's not, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't really count, but uh, I know that we have uh, more than 5,000 downloads per day. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, I, I, it's pretty much. And even though I, uh, we do realize that uh, many things change right now because people love to, to have video, but still uh, audio is, uh, well, we still have quite much listeners that um, keep listening to our uh, podcast. And then, okay, we have, it's 365 days. So from 2009, nine to now it no what I, what I what i mean is you have a rotating stock of different podcasts that that make up 365 days of astronomy yeah. how many do you have at this point you know how many different podcasts make up you know that you're rotating right. through we have self, uh, a few series mm -hmm. uh we have uh podcast um uh, okay I hope that I can answer this one because I don't really uh, counting. But uh, actually, we have uh, series like uh, observing with web that uh, become a last minute astronomer series right now. And then we have uh, as a spaceman. We have mm -hmm. we also have uh, well astronomy guys, of course, and then <clears throat> uh, EVSN. Uh, this is what we currently have. And then also uh, well, Awesome Astronomy, Daily Podcast, um, Deep Astronomy, um, Exoplanet, Exoplanet Series. I think we have more than 20 series in, uh, I can say, actually it's more than 20 series in our wow. um, pro project. So, so, so basically have, right now, you can rotate through 20 plus different shows over the course of, of time. Yes. Yes. So we have a uh, weekly, uh, we, we have weekly podcast. We have uh, every other week podcast. We have monthly po podcast. We have, um, it's uh, irregular, irregular uh, mm -hmm. from uh, our podcasters. So we, we have many things. And in the past, we also have ma uh, many other projects that uh, uh, being yeah, it's not uh, it's not continuing um, in any point. Mm -hmm. But uh, actually, something that I really like about three sixty five days of astronomy, I know that many astronomers or uh, many science communicator, astronomy communicator, they started with uh, the podcast in three sixty five days of astronomy, and then they become uh, professionals in uh, astronomy communicator. And they, uh, I mean, well, some of them, they uh, keep being astronomers but while doing uh, outreach in the podcast. But I do know that some others, they also, uh, uh, I'm not saying they change, but swift their, uh, they switch their interest into science communicator. Mm -hmm. I can see how that would happen. I've been there kind of myself. Um, so how did you, what was your route into getting into astronomy communication? How did you end up here? Um, okay, I started as a <clears throat> astronomy student. I, take my, I took my undergraduate as a, for astronomy and then continue my uh, master's degree in astronomy. By that time, uh, I still thinking that I can uh, <clears throat> um, continue my uh, uh, career as uh, astronomers because I really like extra uh, extrasolar planet. Mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, during my uh, university day, uh, my final project and my thesis is about uh, forty seven Ursa Majoris. But then um, I we started to well, me and my team here, uh, we saw the that um, astronomy news and astronomy informations, we couldn't really find both in this uh, country, mostly in English, if you, well, that's if you have uh, internet connections, because during the early 2000s, not everyone have internet connections just like now. So um, mm -hmm. 
if you have internet connections, then you can go to bad astronomy or you can go to universe today or uh, sky and telescope. But um, I don't really remember about space.com at that time, but that's something that really uh, uh, <clears throat> famous here. And then uh, astronomy news in Indonesia, while well, astronomy hopes is quite plenty here, people uh, just uh, believe whatever they have on their mailing list or their email or their uh, text, uh, text yeah. message. So <clears throat> we uh, decided to have to create an astronomy magazine at that time in Indonesian language. But then we uh, have problem because astronomy magazine like a sky and telescope was, or astronomy magazine in US is quite expensive because we have to uh, print that the magazines and then distribute the magazine. It's it's a lot. And then it the group is astronom astronomers, the fresh graduate of astronomy. And uh, we don't really have, we have the capability of, for astronomy, but uh, writing an article is something new for us. And then um, manage, management for the magazine is totally something that we don't understand. So we have published just one edition and after that we never publish anything. <laughs> Because, well, but not only about the money or the management, but um, we realize that we we want to to convey so many messages. So one article can have like more than fifteen pages. No way oh. we can put fifteen pages for one article in a magazine. So that's another problem, and I think that's the 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 one that uh, makes us uh, shifting our. Uh, idea to uh to block so we mm -hmm. started our block then in 2007 and that's why i then shifting my because i i think after i start writing an article and after we got invited to the schools for uh, public outreach science class and everything i start to think that well i like this and i prefer to do this so i end up become astronomy communicator and uh, I think the one that really changed my life is International Year of Astronomy in 2009. So I went to attend uh, Communicating Astronomy with the Public in 2007 in Athens. And that's how I, in, I, I got involved with International Year of Astronomy. I met uh, Pedro Huzo, the... the that lead International Year of Astronomy 2009. And then mm -hmm. I totally changed my life into astronomy communications, met Pamela in 2010 and 2011 that got me into 365 days of astronomy and here I am now. Are Sorry for the still... long story. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's what we're here for. You you get to tell us all about you. This is a this is your hour and about you. Um I did. Are you still writing uh, for astronomy stories? Are you still doing the blog? Yes, we're still doing the blog. So since 2007 until now, we have our blog running and we have, uh, well, thousands to ten thousands readers. But uh, after this uh, COVID-19, uh, yeah, COVID, yeah, the, the COVID pandemic that everyone's, uh, yeah, uh, before that, that uh, when the social media rise, then people shifting their um, life into social media because I think we are attached to our uh, smartphone. Um, we we start to see that many people prefer to have uh, like short stories or just uh, captions in the image or a uh, video in on YouTube. But uh, at that time, we don't really uh, uh, join to. Um, we don't really. Um, um, going to that uh, platform. We mm -hmm. do share our uh, work in our blog to the platform, but we don't really create a new uh, pro uh, project or program on that, uh, especially for that platform. But right. uh, during COVID-19, uh, everyone's pushed into internet, schools uh, from home and then working from home, makes everyone live on social media. And <clears throat> it may, it's, I, I, when I see the statistic, I, I also see that um, people shift from 
reading a long story into something that they can like a quick glance or a just short video on in uh, on social media but still we uh, provide our uh, article in our blog because uh, this has become the source not only for the public but also for the journalists the science journalists so mm -hmm. they usually use our um, articles and then uh, contact me discuss about it and then provide uh, and then they write their own article for their media outlet and then uh, we also uh, start to have not have uh, we uh, we actually have uh, special uh, content for our uh, social media, but mm -hmm. most of the time we just share our uh, our article in the blog. But then um, during this trip, um, these three years, we start to have our own uh, special content for uh, starting with the video inter video interview for uh, uh, our YouTube and then. Well, we also realized that people love something shorter than the, the video we have. So we start a short video now, uh, not only for YouTube, but also for Instagram and also for TikTok. Because here in Indonesia, people love reels in Instagram and TikTok. Well, it's not my style, maybe, because I think it's too short. I can't really convey the real message. I Quite, I'm a bit afraid if uh, it's become a misinformation for mm -hmm. the readers, uh, for the the well, for our uh, fans and followers. But uh, I can see that some of them try to uh, uh, discuss the the content with us. So I hope that it can build their interest. It can build their curiosity to read our articles because I think that we have. All the content in our blog, so that's how uh, we um, we got. Uh, I that's what I do right now, and also it's still uh, we still have everything, just like in two thousand and seven. But we 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 develop uh, our content accordingly to the current um, trend, mm -hmm. including X. Because okay, Twitter and X, I keep. I don't <laughs> don't get me don't get me started on that whole thing. No, I yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but we do know that people also uh, discuss many things there and uh, on X. I do realize we do realize that um, people love to see the 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 pictures, the 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 current event from with the pictures, even though it's not the beautiful pictures from. Uh, um, advanced telescope but what they want to know is uh, can we also take a pictures for the night sky so uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, we started to uh, share the pictures with smartphone because I do know that everyone have smartphone right now and the technology can help them to take pictures as well without a telescope or with a telescope so we uh, we, we try to share that and it it become something that um, quite trend in our uh, followers there. I feel like I may have to 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 pick your brain a bit about that because that sounds like an excellent series to have in English as well. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I would love <laughs> to see it. <laughs> so, what does uh, what does what does being a part of CosmoQuest, the CosmoQuest community, mean to you? a lot because I learned a lot from CosmoQuest, from the project itself, not only 365 Days of Astronomy. It gave me a lot of ideas uh, here in Indonesia, even though I do I, uh, realize that we can't really uh, 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 we can't really apply everything from, uh, uh, from CosmoQuest in Indonesia because we have different uh, style. For example, 365 Days of Astronomy. I do understand that here we still have many uh, people that listen to the radio or online radio right now. The, st uh, the podcast started to uh, to, to rise uh, here, but still <clears throat> from the statistic, the people still uh, goes to the short video for their, uh, their daily activities uh, or skilling time with the short video, not really mm -hmm. for an audio, but um, so we don't... We, we, even though I, <laughs> this idea has been like 
it more, more than one decade in my my brain that I really want to um, try it in Indonesia, but still <laughs> we we don't really do it because we know that people here they they love something more they're more into visual things not audio it's mm -hmm. quite a bit different than us that uh, the statistic shows that audio is still uh, quite strong that people love to 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 listen to the audio so um that's one thing and then side that i learned many things i love the community even though i don't really uh, active on discord reading everything but <laughs> it's sometimes well our time difference when I want to reply, it's like, okay, they sleep right now. <laughs> and then you guys are uh, really active to talk. <clears throat> I was like, I'm so sleepy right now. <laughs> I I understand because I'm I'm in that that in between, you know, the East Coast has gone to sleep and I'm still awake and your side is not quite up yet. And it's just like no one no one's around to entertain me today. Yeah, that's what my that's what I feel actually. I was like, I want to talk. I want to share many things, but then, okay, not the time. Everyone is sleeping now. <laughs> and this is my lunch time. <laughs> so I am <laughs> basically in your future. It's 6 a.m. Uh, seven, seven, almost 7.30 a.m. November 6. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I have a friend in, I have a friend in Australia, a really good friend who, he's oh, yeah. the reason Australia that I under... Much more. <laughs> he's the reason that i understand the time differences it's like we okay it's tomorrow and it's this okay got it all right um and i get messages from him at weird times he keeps trying to figure out when he can message me that i will actually like answer <laughs> so it's always a challenge we just gave up yeah. and we just send messages and whoever answers whenever is fine um yeah <laughs> uh, how how did i know how covid 19 affected you know the states um and guido talked a little bit about how it affected where he is in europe how did it affect indonesia it's you know what is what is the culture like there and what did it change about that i know that's a very okay. broad question but yeah it's really broad questions and uh, i lost some friends during the COVID 19 but uh, what I see from my point of view as a communicator as well, um, people realize that there is so many hopes during the COVID-19, but actually that those hopes ex exist much more, uh, take a longer time in the past. For example, astronomy, it started like way back to the 90s. And when I started working in uh, early 2000s, I uh, <clears throat> I saw so many hopes for astronomy, but many people like uh, like saying that well the, no it's just a few but everyone can go to do re check and recheck. But then during the COVID nineteen, everyone realized that those hopes can be spread like um, wildfires mm -hmm. or yeah something like that, and then. <clears throat> People tend to believe what they receive in their social media, and it's uh, it makes the government also realize that they really need a, a website, a special web website to debunk hoax, not only about health and ma uh, and maths, but also about everything. So we started to have that, and then for the the pe the public actually, it's it's another challenge because. Uh, we shift everything from in-person activities to online activities. Indonesia mm -hmm. is a, a, a really big country. We have more than 17,000 islands. <clears throat> okay, 18,000 including island and islet. And then we have um, uh, so many... Um, well, basically, with these islands means that uh, we have many people live in another islands, not only the big island here that I... Uh, the one that I well, it's not really the biggest one, but I live in the big in one of the big islands. It's in Java Island, and uh, <clears throat> and here we have uh, the technologies, and we know that most big city have the technology for internet. But during COVID nineteen, it's we are being pushed to to shift from 
offline activities into online activities. And then it means that we need to, to have internet everywhere in this country. And that's mm -hmm. something that um, I think a bit, well, I know COVID-19 is not really, it's not a, a good stories. It's not a good things that we have because we lost many people. But <clears throat> we have to, to, to see that the government being pushed to, to provide the internet for everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I think it's really good. But the, the, the negative part is we, we lost uh, generations that only live on internet. And then they, they schools, they, uh, well, they attend their schools from, uh, from home. And then whilst people in the big city have no problem with that, but those in the rural area or remote area, they have really a big challenge on having internet at that time. So the teachers, they just go from home to, uh, from one uh, house to another house to try to teach the, the students or provide everything. So that's what happened in the remote area. And then, <clears throat> but uh, in another things that um, we, like I said, we lost a generations because we have those children that never attend schools in person for a short period of time. For example, if they just start in their middle school, then they have three uh, three years. And then during COVID-19, we just more, almost three years, they never met their friends. And then after that, they have to attend high school. And that's, well, it's, um, I think it's about social communications or something like that. And also the, the differences between online school and offline schools, I do a, um, talk with many uh, lecturers as well. And they, um, they said that <clears throat> the quality during the online schools, it quite drop after these children, these students goes to the offline schools and take exams or something or do their project. And there's, they see that there is a different quality there. Mm -hmm. So it's really a big challenge to, to, to teach uh, online students. And sometimes here is because we don't, really have uh, good connections so we don't really know what the students do Be why because uh, they mute themselves they mute themselves they stop their their video so we don't know what actually they doing. <laughs> so i am pretty well i am i am pretty sure that in the the you know year and a half that my kid was online due to covid that he never once turned on his camera um, other than like just to confirm that it was him in attendance and then it would go right back off. And I'm pretty, you know, and, and it, it is exactly what you said. The classes themselves, you know, the teachers weren't prepared for this. So they struggled that entire time to try and make online learning work. And in a lot of cases, it didn't. I, I'm pretty sure that my my child has taken two years of French and speaks exactly none of it. Um, and, and you know, yeah, we ended up having to pull him out of in-person school because it just wasn't working for him because it was such a huge change and adjustment that, that he now, he's still going to his high school, but he goes entirely mm -hmm. from home because it was just a, a much more workable solution for him. And since... Yeah like none of his friends went to his high school anyway it it didn't really change that but also he doesn't get to make any new friends from from any yeah. of this that's exactly so, what happened and also yeah the, 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 the teachers themselves they are they they are different generations the old generations that thought they don't really live in uh, on this uh, uh cyber world while mm -hmm. the the students is Generation Z, Z or Generation Alpha, they currently lives on their uh, on the cyber world. So it's really a big differences and a a, uh, a big challenge to adjust um, for this life and also for the economy. It's, it's uh, itself. We have many uh, many shop, many stores. Uh, the the small mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, well. I don't know exactly the English word, but they have to. Uh, we we call them we call them mom and pop stores here because they're the they're not big box owned yes. you know franchise kinds yeah. of things. They're 
yeah. the neighborhood store on the corner. Yes, that's what I mean. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> they are forced to be enclosed because they don't have the resource and capability to uh, keep continue during the COVID-19, even though some of them shifting their, their, uh, their activities, their, their, their projects into online. But, uh, well, um, it's not easy to really um, face to face with those uh, big stores that have the resource to have a, a, an online uh, stores or uh, just they, they, they also, um, well, the, the small stores, they, um, they actually join the marketplace, but still, well, wow. it's not something that can be easy to do if you don't really uh, being involved on this cyber world for years. So mm. that's another problem. And then here, um, people become interested in short video, TikTok or Instagram or Facebook reels, and then they uh, sell everything there. This is another challenge for the offline stores that don't really understand how to uh, how to marketing themselves or even they know that how to mar to market themselves then they have to um, face to face with the influencers who or the the, the artists the art that uh, sells everything or market many things on the uh, internet so this the, this is a big challenge for indonesia in uh, economic term in many i think in many ways actually mm -hmm. and i i think it's it's similar around the world you know if you were no one was prepared. No one, no one was prepared. Yeah. And, and we didn't have, uh, in a lot of cases, we didn't have the infrastructure. We didn't have the, the people and, and the knowledge base. And I, I don't know that we'll ever go completely back because there were a lot of, you know, a lot of us that were, were fine. I mean, I, I was, my kid was, my husband was, we all, we were, I was working from home anyway. Everything I do is pretty much remote. Um, so it wasn't for us it wasn't a bad time in that respect but it was just hard to watch other people and know there's there's not really anything you can do and and yeah. it you know i feel like one of the benefits of cosmoquest is that at least during during that time period we could be there for each other that this very online yeah. community leaned in and and just tried their best to support even though like, you know, yeah, what our, our primary goal is communicating science, but we also build community. And yeah, so exactly. Okay. I, I would love to add this. Well, one thing that about your questions, there's a life changing here. After COVID, everyone's preferred to do everything online. That's uh, why uh, we have another challenge right now with the uh, offline stores. But then uh, another life changing is everyone being pushed during COVID-19 19 to uh, work from home and then uh, at first they laugh because they love it because well we can do many things here but then it's about time management that uh, they think that dur during their work from home they can also do other things but mm -hmm. uh, this is the thing that I uh, actually discussed with Tilina back then uh, Tilina Henatigala and uh, he shared about uh, how he managed uh, his, uh, his team that during the, the 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 working time, then you work. It's not it's supposed to be the same, but you're mm -hmm. from home, so you can't do many things with other. Uh, you can you can't do parallel para, parallel things actually. So it's something mm -hmm. like that. Here it's a, another challenge after a few months. While for me, I'm still I'm working online since first day I work. So. <laughs> I don't think many things change for me because I still Cosmo Quest and then my group here in Indonesia, everything is online actually. We don't really have offline uh, office, so nothing changed. The one thing that changed is I just can't go hang out with my friends on a cafe. But then the things that you said, we built community. We It's like a family. And then during uh, uh, 2000, and wait, it's last year, during... Uh, I I lost my mom last year and when she um, when it's quite it's something that shocked me actually I don't really talk about this but why I want to talk because uh, Pamela helped me a lot that 
that time. Um, it's um, basically from the time that we uh, need to admit my mom. We we call the ambulance because she's um, fainted at home and she she <clears throat> she she's unconscious. I'm I'm panic, and I know at that time it's uh, three a.m. in the morning. And I do realize no one wake up at that time except for uh, CosmoQuest. So I just go to Discord and I uh, told Pamela and then she called me. It's like more than five hours calls during uh, waiting for the ambulance until uh, <clears throat> my mom being submitted to, uh, well, the emergency. And then, uh, well, it's... It's really a long talk and then it really helps me to go to everything. So yes, Cosmo Quest really not only built a project that we can share about astronomy, but we build community, we build um, the sense of uh, belonging. And I really, really thanks uh, to be part of Cos Cosmo Quest actually. And we are we are definitely glad you are here, Aviva. It is it is so nice, and and for getting to see you for once has been really nice too. Uh, yeah, because I'm mostly yeah mostly because you sometimes can talk on Discord. <laughs> yeah, I know, but you know, uh, during um, COVID, because I can't go to 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 meet my friend in person as well. And uh, usually, I met Pamela during a CAP conference at least uh, mm -hmm. one or two years. Um, that we can meet and now we don't, I never meet, I don't meet anyone giving me a sense like, do I really uh, work with person, uh, with human, or I just talk <laughs> with the robot or myself? It we're, is like, we're, we're all AI I'm, now, we're all AI now. AI now, I think so too. <laughs> but yeah, I uh, I really love to uh, being part of Cosmo Quest and working uh, and sharing the astronomy with the public. And I really love to see uh, <clears throat> all the citizens, citizen science project in CosmoQuest as well, because it really involves many, many people. Mm -hmm. And I do, uh, I do think that this can uh, build not only interest, but, uh, and curiosity, but I, for astronomy, for as a hobby, but I hope that more and more people uh, will pursue uh, science and uh, astronomy in particular as the career i i hope well i know we have well. many challenges in the future but i do hope that <laughs> i hope that as well and i i am i am behind you 100 percent on this um Thank you. <laughs> if we what would you do if we raised an, a dream amount of money is there anything that you would do with 365 days of astronomy that you can't do now Actually, this is the uh, the idea that I have right now because I I mean um, previously I I want to share the 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 image, but then I met many challenges to to find the image to 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 upload and post in Instagram. But actually, I think that if possible, can we create a really short video like a teaser for every uh podcast that we have like maybe we 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 have uh the the main idea of the podcast of the day or okay not every day but at least uh, weekly so maybe we can create something uh, like a real so to to capture more people to um to 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 listen to the podcast in 365 days with Stromy. That's one thing. Or um, if we can have uh, more and more people uh, uh, share their uh, project or maybe their uh, activities. Like, uh, um, I, I really think that if we can, I want to have people to submit a short audio about their uh, experience to uh, use smartphone or uh, anything they have with or without telescope to observe the sky and they can also provide us with the pictures and we can post it somewhere not only 
on the website but also on our social media that's something that uh, i think we we lack right now but uh, well short video i think that's something that i hope that we can have but i know it's another challenge because we need uh we need <laughs> more resource <laughs> for that yeah it, but I it's would love I, to see it actually i've 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 made a few and the learning curve is there um and also you know just the time and and the imagination and the planning and then putting it all together the posting is the easy part it's it's all the things yeah. that lead up to that and so that and and if you know if we had the money that is a thing that i know ali and i really 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 want to do as well um we both want to do more reels and clips and and again i i mentioned this earlier today that you know there will be a tiktok because we we understand as well that everything has become very visual and so we need to be yeah. able to add some visuals to the podcasts that we have out there and do some of these things to to generate more interest and to yes. to get the information out there yeah and so, i would love to uh to to do that as well and i i think Great. that uh, the three of us could make a very awesome project or two or yeah. three happen if we had the the money and time to do it yes well maybe not daily but a few in a month that a few uh, a few videos in a month that would be great i i find that once you have sort of a an idea you can tweak it pretty easily it's it's getting yes. it all laid out the first couple of times that that are really difficult um yes. because the first time you're learning and you're you're beating yourself up trying to figure out how do i do it the second time you're trying to remember how you did it the first time because you did so many things the wrong way and then after that it it starts to get easier so i'm yes. i would like to get to the point where we have that kind of time to really learn it and then we can all just sort of like here's a here's a template now we can make videos really quickly <clears throat> yeah exactly and here we started uh the short video not long ago actually not long ago because it's just like one or two months ago that we started this and kind of really a big help <laughs> because they have many any many uh they, they have the the the, the 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 so the 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 capability even though i think that uh, for the video i still prefer to do it in the real uh video editor or uh, at least in my keynote i usually use keynote for a short video but canva make it makes makes it easy but then um well at, at, for me everything is start from the first step after that we learn just like you said we learn from our mistake and then after mm -hmm. that we analyze everything and revise our uh, strategy and after that that's much more easier to do mm -hmm. yeah and i i definitely i'm definitely one for canva i i love canva i have i have grown to really appreciate all of the things that it can do but um yes. <clears throat> i won't too. i won't I won't discount Adobe Express and and what I've learned to do on there as well. And the fact that we have two of them means they mm -hmm. both keep getting better. So yes, exactly. It's it's very helpful. And and so definitely I would love, you know, that's one of the things that I would love to see that we we have more money and time for is is doing those kinds of yeah. projects. So, you know, um we are we are at fifty one hundred dollars raised right now. Um and we're still trying to get to that ten thousand dollar mark and there's only a handful more of ours. So if you have the capability and you can drop a few more dollars in the bucket, that's great. If you have ever downloaded an episode of 365 Days of Astronomy, if you can just put $5 in the till, you know, it will go a long way to getting us to where we yeah. need to be. So thank you, everybody. Yes. Thank you, Aviva, for, for joining us today. I'm really glad that thank we can find you. a time that overlapped. <laughs> we'll have to find a <laughs> more. <laughs> yeah, and now you know why I don't really uh, even reply on this, Gordon. <laughs> I completely understand. Like I said, my friend Paul and I, it's it's always a challenge yeah. to like find where that window is where the two of us are both awake. So um, we're, we'll work on that and we'll find more times where, where you can participate and, and, you know, it'll be later in the day for me and everybody else can wander off because I'll still be awake anyway. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you for having me, actually. (laughs) Thank you, Aviva. We're going to, are we ready to go to Veronica with another um, look at our Minecraft? I'm hoping so. Allie has unmuted. so We are. We are ready. Okay. Okay. All right. Fantastic. We're going to, we're going to move on to Veronica and uh, we'll see you guys at the top of the next hour for a live EVSN recording, which we have not done in a while. So (laughs) hold on to your hats. There's going to be sausage people. (laughs) All right. I'm switching over to you now, Veronica. You're live. Hello, everyone. Just wanted to show you another Easter egg that's going to be in our build. Um, It's a thank you to all the builders and tour guides. Whoops. Or it would be even better if I didn't destroy it. (laughs) Yes, it's been that kind of a day for me. Uh, Thank you. To which I can't spell all the builders and tour guides. Okay, now let's see if I can not destroy it before I get out of here. Excellent. Okay, running away before I break another thing. So this is just kind of in a bat cave. And you have to try to really look and search for that. I probably won't remember where it is either. We have got so much building done the last couple of days. Sometimes we finish a a hat build and it's like, oh, there was so much more I wanted to do, but we've really got a lot done this time. I'm really impressed. So we've got um, quite a complex of buildings here and a huge solar array that uh, to power it all. Of course, we still have the lander and hopefully someday we'll be able to power it up and come back home to y'all. But in the meantime, we've got a really good science laboratory here. And we've got all the kilns and storage. Got some potions going on here. Potions, lotions, and what have you. And hi, Gordon. We see you. (laughs) <laughs> oh, there we go. And let's see what else we got here. Oh, this is the biology table. Got some plants and some different things going on. Alrighty. And then this is H2O for you. So we've got a lot of water um, projects going on here. Uh, So this one is uh, Danger Deep Excavation. Oh, so, yeah, that's, you don't have to worry about that. Because, uh, low gravity, right? Oh, I didn't splash. Dang. Okay, so there's that. That's quite the setup. What's this here? Danger, untreated water. Okay, maybe I should get out of that. Maybe don't go swimming in the untreated water. Not saying that they have anything bad in it, but uh, I don't want to find out this weekend. Not not this weekend. All right, it looks like we've got quite a bit of water collection going on. I suspect this has something to do with the uh, glaciers that are under the surface here on Earth. Always swim in the drinking water. It's cleaner. That's right. Exactly. All right, so let me see if I can get out of here without that. 
What was on going on down here? Hopefully this is the clean water, but it doesn't really look like it. Yes. Yes, he's immensely <sighs> Oh, hey, what's this? Oh, wow. Oh, what is some of it still in ice? Oh, this is pretty cool. Well, we definitely don't have to worry about running out of water, at least not for but Somebody's really put a lot of effort into this. And and I do appreciate the lights because sewer systems should have lights. I think that should always be the case. And I'm kind of wondering where this goes to. If it just kind of goes to a dead end, I'll be kind of sad. Let's go see. Got a little bit ways to go. Infrastructure is important. That is very true. Oh, look, this is, oh, here's a little exit. Oh my gosh, there's a fountain. We found the fountain of youth. It's on Mars. And it's well stocked. Excellent. Okay, so let's go find where we were previously. There it is. I see that building. There's another little cavern here. There are lots of nooks and crannies to build in. Okay, so that looks like a building. But I don't think it is. Unless it's a blind for Star Trek. Are you checking us out up here? Uh, all right. <sighs> Not this time, I have to wait a little bit longer, Spock. Okay, so we've got our satellite station, got our vegetable garden, and I believe this is the, uh, one of the research centers. Let's take a look here. Oh, yes. Now, this is the we're keeping track of everything we're doing. There's the real chemistry set. Oh, this is... Have I been... Oh, the crystals. No, this one's different. There's a lot of science going on here. This is cool. Okay. And a crater. Now, this... Uh, this building... is the research center and fish farm for friends. And still is pretty empty. There is um, a little fish distribution system here. Sort of like a vending machine, but it doesn't cost you anything. And this is the top floor. Looks like there's some decontamination areas before we can go out and go swimming. Oh, uh, the lander looks so pretty from here. Through all the glass and lights. All right, well, let's get out of here and go on to something new. Excellent. So this is, I think, one of the biggest projects I've seen that uh, just started today, water treatment and processing. So this is where you get the fresh water to go swimming in, or I mean, to do dishes and, and drink. Yeah, that's it. You know, waste water by going swimming, especially if we can't find it. For being water treatment, there sure isn't much water. Although I do like the humidity pipes. Okay, now that has to be the best computer screen I've seen. The monitors in the other areas just don't compare. That is awesome. 
Uh, I wonder if that one's attached. Uh, dang it. Ah, where's the exit? Oh, that makes sense. Behind you. It's always behind you. Now, where's the button? Button, who's got the button? There we go. Well, this looks awesome, Admin. Now, if you're getting tired at all, um, we do have a place to rest. And uh, this is for civilians as well as uh, people here on work. It's a fancy pants hotel. It's got uh, lots of uh, nooks and crannies. You've got a nice book nook. Um, this is like a... I wonder if they're supposed to have the fish that clean the stuff off your toes. I don't know about that. I'm not sure I'm going to stick my feet in it if they're out and watching me. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Oh. <gasps> Vines you can climb. I like it. Okay. Uh, who made the monitor? Oh. Admin generated it. Nice. Yes. Oh, got some doors, a little bit of privacy. The art's a little creepy, but, uh, you know, to each their own. Ooh, blue flowers. That's a little bit more classical. I guess the fire makes you feel warm. Oh, this is a pretty little zen area. And there's the skeleton again. Okay. Oh, I love the climbing rigs in here. Just get a nice good workout going. Oh, no one liked my CME narrative. No, we did. Ah. Those doors are confusing. <sighs> Although I think it's probably mostly operator error. Curry in a hurry? Keep your suit on. Um, I'm not too sure how successful this place is going to be. Uh, but uh, I guess if you're in a hurry, you can at least get a curry. So, what else have we not looked at lately? I'm kind of check in with chat. Ooh, thanks for the bits. That's very kind of you. Oh, this one has purple lights and solar panels. Now, this is, oh, uh, this is the water treatment. Was no, This isn't the water treatment. This is the H2O. This is the well that you don't want to go swimming in. Okay, I remember this one. Hello. Okay. Not gonna make that mistake twice in one tour. Throw back to us whenever you want. Okay. Well, I think that we've gone over everything and got a bit, done a little bit more exploring than we did previously. So let's see what we're gonna go do next. I don't so, so up next.